Today, we're going to talk about continuing Elijah's story. And it made me think when I, when I look at it, it made me think about something that Jesus prayed. You know, uh, I remember that even though I wasn't a believer, I remember praying this prayer in middle school. Our basketball coach would lead us through this and, and lead us through the model prayer, the Lord's prayer. And there's a line in that prayer that's always kind of um, hit me uniquely. Jesus said in this prayer, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I got it up here for you. Yeah, uh, hallowed is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what does that really mean? What does it mean for Jesus to say, hey, hey, Father God, let your your will is always done in heaven. Let your kingdom come on earth like it is in heaven. Because it can't just be a theory, right? The, the kingdom of God on earth is not just a theory. It's a reality. But so often, one of the hardest things about Christianity is we don't often know how to take statements like that. What does it mean to take theology, the study of God, what does it mean to take that to the pavement? right? What does it mean for the kingdom to come as a parent? Well, that's why they write lots of books on this stuff, you know? What does it mean for the kingdom to come in business, in a meeting, in a contract negotiation? What does, what does it mean for the kingdom to come? How does this stuff come in reality? Because it can't just be theory. You know, one of the things I talk to our staff a lot is the difference between vision and strategy. We talk, you, you almost hear those words, and this applies to this very much, actually, believe it or not. We use these terms vision and strategy all the time in the marketplace. You hear them all the time, regardless of where you work. You hear about vision, 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 and you hear about strategy, strategic, and people use them the same way. They're far from, dip, they're far from the same thing. The way I talk to our staff about it a lot is an uh, image you've seen me use before is Oz and the Yellow Brick Road. Now, I'm not, please don't think for a second, if you're a guest for the first time, in no way am I comparing the kingdom of God to Oz, okay? Like, seriously, please don't let your mind go there. This, every illustration breaks down at some point, okay? But, but let's just say that the, the kingdom of heaven is Oz. Well, everybody needs a Yellow Brick Road, right? You have to have a yellow brick road to teach you how or to show you how do we get to Oz. And, and so here at Clearview, our yellow brick road is path to purpose. Brian Hatcher's going to be doing a lot of different things this year to help you understand what does it mean for you to discover your purpose. So when we talk a lot about what Jenny Ross just showed up there about, about the, the egg hunt coming up, we, we have, we're doing that for a reason. Our vision is that the kingdom would come in Franklin as it is in heaven. Our vision is that, that the big picture vision is that, that God's kingdom would come here at Clearview as it is in heaven. But how do you actually make that happen? Well, the way we're doing that this year is through Give Us Franklin. And I promise you all this matters to Elijah in just a minute. Just stay with me. So give us Franklin is our vision. We're asking the Lord to give us Franklin. We're asking, we're asking the Lord to open up doors to non-believers in our community because it, it's needed now more than ever. And so look at our, that's our strategy. This is our strategy. That's our vision. Our strategy is the 2021 strategy is not fellowship gatherings for believers at Clearview. The 2021 strategy is using what we call together events for the purpose of sharing the love of Christ with our town. We're going to use together events, being together in all kinds of different ways, shapes, form, and fashions from little bitty kids to, to active adults. We're going to use together events to Ask the Lord to use those as doors to give us Franklin. This weekend, we've already had a, a few. Tracy Sellers had uh, some uh, mops, moms and some different moms in the community get together, and they went to a farm and did uh, the goat thing and the chicken thing and all the things for the little kids. And Tracy sent me back a text saying, um, uh, just so you know, a goat chewed on my hair, and I, I stepped in a bunch of stuff. Uh, I know, um, is this part of my job requirement? 
Um, and, and she had the best time. I mean, she, her and, and Sarah Jane uh, were there, and they just did such a great job. That's a together event, right? And Jenny just talked about the egg hunt coming up. I think this is the first time, it might actually be ever, if not in a long time, with the egg hunt coming up. Uh, I think it's next Saturday. Keep going uh, to the... There we go. Uh, April the 3rd, 3 o'clock. Now, look, just so you know, in case you're worried, there's not going to be an Easter bunny on the campus. All right? Never. Never, never, never. Never, never, never. Right? But what, what's Jenny doing with that? She's, she's using that event. There's going to be a gospel presentation. And, we're, and you know what's really cool about that is a lot of our active adults stuffed those eggs. Isn't that cool? That helping us reach a different generation, I, I love it. Those are, those are yellow brick road strategies. So we're asking God to give us Franklin because we want God to use this, but you can't just talk about it. You actually have to do it. So when Jesus talks about your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, that's not a theory. You actually have to do something, right? I'll tell you another story of a lady that's doing something in our church that's so neat, man. Uh, this is, and she has no idea I was going to talk about her today if you're in here. Nancy, if you're watching over in the chapel. This is Nancy Thomas and Jerry and her family. Nancy actually works on staff here. Isn't that, a good, isn't that just an awesome family? That's like a magazine cover or something, you know, and the glare coming right off Jerry's head. It's like totally photoshopped. You know that it is. Um, but, but so you look at Nancy. Now, let me tell you something about Nancy. Nancy is, you know what Nancy is? Nancy's a quiet doer. You just look around and all of a sudden things just are done. Nancy's been leading a, a study called King, Keys to Freedom. It comes through our partnership with, with, with Mercy Multiplied. And Keys to Freedom is something that's big on Nancy's heart. It, de- it helps women understand it. It's for women and men, but Nancy's been putting together women's Bible studies and it deals with anything from self-image, self-worth, how you look at yourself in the eyes of Christ, your identity in Christ, your spiritual power in Christ, your spiritual gifting in Christ, overcoming strongholds, overcoming demonic forces, lies you've been told since you were a little girl, all the things that society pressures you. I mean, this is, I mean, pavement level stuff, the kingdom of heaven on the pavement, right? And she's done like seven of these. How cool is that? Why? Because, because it matters to her. See, the kingdom of God cannot come if you're not willing to take it out of theory and to the street. So that's why we talk a lot about you discovering your calling. You have to be willing to step into the darkness. You have to be willing to step into society. You can't just talk about it. You actually have to take action. You really do. And for some of you, that's just a step you haven't taken yet. Some of you have a, a real burden at our church for students. I can promise you right now, Graham Inman is waiting. So that's him calling right this moment, okay? <laughs> That's, that, that's, that's, you know, that's, he, that's how fast. We, we, Graham and I work together all the time <laughs> on stuff. He's waiting. He's ready. Some of you have a burden for our student ministry to get better and bigger. Good. Do something. Do something. Do something. Some, some of you have a, a real burden. A lot, of you, uh, that, that, a lot of you in our millennial generation, some of you are watching, a lot of you watch from, from your university. You tune into your home church, Clearview. You, you see a lot of the social injustice. You see a lot of the racism. You see it's real. Do something. Don't just post about it. That's virtue signaling. Don't just post about it. Posting is good. Do something. You know what Martin Luther King did? He did something. He did something. If you look at anybody that's ever changed the world, they didn't see themselves as world changers. They just did something. Just do something. And we have an impact mission fund right now at our church. If God gives you a burden of any kind, just like a burden he gave Nancy, he gave Nancy a burden, Nancy did something. See, we, we, we're ready for that, man. We're ready for that. If God gave, gave you a burden, by the way, if God gives you a burden and you don't really know what to do with it, let me tell you what to do. Email us. Me, Shane, Brian, one of us, we'll sit down with you. One of our pastors, John Garner, we got several pastors here. We will sit down with you, and we will help you make sense of that burden. 
And we'll turn it into a reality that the kingdom of heaven would, would t- translate into the kingdom of earth because God is wanting us to do something. And I'm going to tell you what I told you again uh, last week. I'm going to say it again. You have to step into, into the world you're called to because if you don't, then nothing really changes. And that is the problem of Christianity across America. I said it to you last week, and I'm going to say it again. You're never going to experience the power of holy God if all you want is the comfort of a church. You're never going to experience the power of holy God if all you want is the comfort of a church. And so today we're going to look at this this Navigating Strange Days series. It's the last sermon here. We're looking at Elijah. And this is a man that did something. One man, he did something. He stopped talking about it. And actually, this is one of the weirdest, wildest, craziest stories in all of Scripture that we're going to read today. Elijah had a real crisis on his hands. He really did. I'll tell you, kind of, let me give you the, kind of the back story before we read it. There's two people that he's really involved with, Ahab and Jezebel. Okay, those are the two people that in in his current crisis, Ahab is king, Jezebel's the wife, and she's a bad woman. Okay, like you just you just you just don't want this woman mad at you. Okay, because she's she's got weird powers, man. I mean, she's just bad news and all the way around. And so Ahab was in some ways living in two worlds. He was trying to serve the people of Israel trying to serve as false gods in Baal, and so he was straddling the line. Jezebel wasn't straddling any lines. She was a prophetess. She was a priestess, if you will, for Baal, and Baal was the god of fertility. He was also the god, the, the false god, but a god of rain, he was, and that's going to matter in just a minute. He's, he was the god of all kinds of strange things that people look to instead of looking at the Yahweh God. And so what had happened was the people of God had become polluted. The actual, so I want to put this in a modern day context, okay? Let me, let me kind of give you a modern day backdrop here. This may not make sense to you. I want you to imagine for a second, imagine, this This makes sense of Ahab and Jezebel. If we put this in 2021, so imagine that in America, Christianity was the official state religion, Okay? Just imagine for yourself that you were required, or if, if it was just, or it was the predominant. It was the predominant and pretty much the one that that you were pressured to conform to in Christianity, right? And then imagine along the way there comes a, a president of the United States that's in, in all the presidents before him had always been very loyal, or at least loyal strongly to Yahweh God. And then along comes this president named Ahab. And this president is a guy that says, well, you know, Jesus may not be the only way to heaven. I mean, he, you, you, as long as you're sincere in your faith and as long as you really do try, and, and, and who's to say, really, that your way, we're all going to the same destination. Sound familiar? And it, it's, it's America, right? And so all of a sudden, you've got... A king that, or a president in this case, that was put in there to represent the Lord God, and now he's going to the middle. And Elijah's got a real issue on his hands now, right? So I want you to turn, if you got your Bibles, to 1 Kings 18. That's where we're going. 1 Kings 18. It's in the kind of the first part of your Bible, okay? And we're going we're gonna to keep, we're going to finish out Elijah here. It's right after First and Second Samuel. You'll see First and Second Kings, First Kings chapter 18. And so today we're going to talk about this idea of doing something, right? That the kingdom of heaven, the, that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. What does that actually mean? And so I'm going to call this today the DNA of world changers, because I think that's what's going on here. You've got, you've got a world changer on your hands, and Elijah's just trying to do his job, but he ends up being a world changer. And so today what I want to do, remember what the Navigating Strange Days thing was all about. The Navigating Strange Days series has all been about you looking at biblical characters and lifting out of those things 
the, the truths of their life, taking, taking out of the pages the actual DNA of the heart of these people and how do they navigate their current culture. And that's what we're doing. So, so what has happened in the story is the people of God, that's people, let's imagine, put yourself there for a minute. The people of God are kind of living between two worlds. They're, they're saying they serve God, but they're also serving the Baals, worshipers at times. And Elijah has had enough, Right? As we would say, he's over it, right? And so now, now he, uh, he starts doing some things. So Ahab is, is the king, and we're going to pick it up in verse 17 of chapter 18. And so Obadiah summons Ahab to go find Elijah. They, and uh, he, Ahab hasn't seen Elijah in a long time. Because remember, Elijah had been by a brook, and he had been with a widow, where God had been teaching him how to be trusting of God's power. And so in verse 17, when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, is this you, you troubler of Israel? Now that's a big statement. You see, Ahab really did think that Elijah was the problem. Elijah wasn't backing down. Elijah wasn't stepping backward. And, and the man who was trying to be pleasing to everybody, he said, you're the cause of the problem there, big boy. And so I love what Elijah says. I've not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, because you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and you followed the Baals. And then Elijah says to Ahab, now send and gather to me all of Israel on Mount Carmel and together bring or together with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So this is like the Wild West, right? I mean, this is Wyatt Earp squaring off on the, the, you know, the, the worst kind of enemy there. I mean, there, 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 this is showdown time, right? Verse 20, so Ahab sent a message among all the sons of Israel, and he brought the prophets together. In verse 20, Elijah came near to all the people, and he said, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal... Is God follow him? Maybe one of the saddest verses in all of Scripture, but the people didn't answer him a word. That's the people of God, by the way. Imagine me standing up in front of you and saying, "If Jesus is the only way to heaven, say Amen. And if Jesus is not the only way to heaven, then don't say a word." And they just they don't they don't say a word. Yeah, just so it's known. Imagine, imagine how that would. I mean, it's gotten bad, right? So let me, let me just, for the sake of time, let me tell you what happened. So Elijah, Elijah pulls together an altar. And, and on that altar, they, he starts basically saying, tell you what, I'm going to give you some time, all you Baal priests. So all the, the preachers, guys like me, if you preach for Baal, here's what you're going to do. You, you got all the time you need. Call on your God. And we got a sacrifice here. And, and, and the God that brings the fire from heaven, that's the real God. I mean, can you imagine like going to the roundabout in Franklin? You know, putting together like a whole bunch of stuff from like Whole Foods or something. Because we don't really have bulls unless you go, that's, that's a big deal, you know. You just, they're not just readily available, you know. So imagine you build this big altar with all of these things that matter to us in Williamson County, like Wi-Fi and stuff, you know, and you put it on the altar or something. And you say, okay, we're just going to ask whichever God brings down. First of all, you got to be some kind of prophet to step into that arena, man. We're going to get to that. I'm going to get ahead of myself if I'm not careful. So that's where the story is, and it says in verse 26, the prophets of Baal, they took the ox which was given to them, and they prepared it, and they called on the name of Baal from morning until noon. Oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. They leapt about the altar which they had made, and it came about noon. This is, this, time out for a second. This is maybe my favorite Old Testament moment like ever this is what every preacher really longs to do is like smack talk all of you guys without remorse okay <laughs> so this is what he says 
I mean, this is, this is literally the best. If, the, if you don't like this, like, you just need to find another church. This is really cool, okay? So it came about to noon. Elijah mocked them, and he says, Call out with a louder voice, for he is a god. Either he's occupied. You know what that means, by the way? He's gone to the bathroom. Look it up in Hebrew. I took a class. And, or maybe he's gone aside. Or maybe he's on a journey. This is my favorite. Perhaps he is asleep. And he needs to be awakened. I mean, this is, this is raw. And so they cry with a loud voice. They cut themselves. Think about the chaos of that. According to their custom, with their swords and their lances, until blood gushed out of them. And when midday was passed, they raved until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. And Elijah tells all the people, come, come here. Y'all, y'all come here. And he, he repairs the altar in verse 30 that they tore down. In other words, they had a, I mean, and I'm not being funny. They had like this mosh pit around the, the altar. And they literally stomped and carried on and flailed about and cut themselves. And through such a circus, they tore down the altar. So he has to build it back together. And he says, everybody, y'all, y'all come here, come here. Okay. You ready? And so, now this guy's no superhero. He's just a normal man doing his job. It says, he took the 12 stones according to the number of the tribes, and he tells them, Israel shall be your name. Verse 32, so with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar. And then he arranged the wood, and he cut the ox into pieces, and he laid it. And then he does something really unique. He starts pouring water on it, right? Just so nobody could say there was no trick. I mean, he's pouring water on it. And the water flowed all around the altar till it was filled in the trench. And at the time of the offering, verse 36 says, Elijah came near, and he says, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God of Israel, and I am your servant, and I've done all these things according to your word. Answer me, Lord, answer me. See, he doesn't really, I mean, he's on the line here. In fact, more than Elijah, his God is on the line. This is no small thing. And, it's, and he says, answer me, that, but look at what he says, that they may know, that, O Lord God, that you have turned their hearts back. And then fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and it licked up all the water that was in the trench. And when the people saw it, they fell on their face, and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. We're going to stop there because there's just a lot more to go. But Elijah does, then then he just, then he kills them all, and then the story gets, it's even more raw. I mean, this, this was a big day in the life of the people of Israel. So here's the question that I've been asking myself for two weeks, just internally. What in the world does this story have to do with 2021? Like, this is so far removed from the way I look at life. It's so far, but it's in there, right? We know that what's ever in the word of God is there for a reason. God put it, God, there's, there's millions of stories about the people of God. So God's Holy Scripture is canonized, meaning it's locked into time, and and God wants these stories in there that made it in there. And so, therefore, what? I keep going, God, what? How in the world does this make sense today? What's the point of all this? And I was digging deep and digging deep and digging deep, and, and I believe at the end of it, we can see that it's all because Elijah had a crisis on his hands. The people of God were starting to walk two paths. They were trying to be two different kinds of people, and you can't do that. You're going to forget one of the personalities. I think it was Nathaniel Hawthorne that one time said, no man can be two people. No no man can wear two faces, lest eventually he forget which one is his. Something to that effect. So... The problem is spiritual pollution in the people of God. That's the problem, spiritual pollution. So we talked 
this morning a minute ago about taking the kingdom of heaven and taking it to the pavement. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what kind of DNA is it of a world changer? I don't think Elijah saw himself. I don't think Elijah thought we'd be talking about him thousands of years later. I think Elijah got up and did his job one day. I really do. In fact, most people that I've ever met that did anything of significance that had lasting change in their community, in their town, in their business place, they didn't set out to change the world. They just obeyed God and things took place. So what's the DNA there? What, what, what can we learn about me and you, you know, all these people, you hear people praying all the time, God, use me. You hear people saying, I want to be used of God. Okay, okay. Then how does that look? Well, I would, I would say that God uses those who are willing to step into the kingdom of Rena. I, I, I would write that down if you're taking notes. That's, that's one thing I can learn. Elijah's story teaches me that, 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 that God uses those who are willing to step into the kingdom arena. Elijah had belief. I talked about that last week. He had a belief system, and that That belief wasn't just positive thinking. He actually believed God. He was willing to follow God when God told him to go to the brook and and live there for a while. He was willing to go to the widow's house and let the widow provide for him for a while. He was willing to go confront Ahab on Mount Carmel. He was, you know, what did I tell you? Elijah did what God told him to do, and he went where God told him to go. It wasn't complicated. Elijah was willing to step into the arena. You can't can't be afraid of the darkness, and you can't be afraid of getting it wrong. And I think that's what happens a lot of times with people, is they want to be used of God, but they're so afraid of doing something wrong in Jesus' name that they don't do anything. And I want to stand in front of you and say, I have done a lot of things wrong in the name of Jesus. I have. I'm not talking about sin stuff. I'm talking about like idea kind of stuff. I mean, I've done sin stuff too. But I've, done, I've taken all kinds of wild shots in Jesus' name. I don't think he's mad at me. Really. I learned a lot. I had things I had to, I mean, how else are you going to learn? Take risks in ministry. Mess up churches. That's what you got to do. There's, I should write a book on that. Right? Take chances. I'm not saying be impulsive. But I'm saying to you, out of a fear of getting it wrong, we tend to do nothing when our world is hurting and waiting on somebody to do anything. Instead of just post on Facebook, ain't it bad? Somebody should do something. I don't know who they is, but they evidently have a lot of power because they should do something. You ever hear that? You know, they should do something. They is you. So let me tell you why this matters when I say step into the kingdom arena. Here's a modern-day picture of of Zarephath where uh, Ahab and Jezebel lived. That's basically, it's almost modern-day Lebanon, okay? Not where the outlets are, uh, as you can obviously tell. So let me tell you why that was a big deal. When God told Abraham, or when God told Elijah to go in, in Ahab and Jezebel's backyard, let me tell you why that mattered. That was enemy territory. That would be like me. Let me give you a modern day example. It'd be like me walking smack up into the middle of Iran, walking up to one of their capitals, standing on the steps of one of their mosques and saying, Jesus is the only way. And if you don't repent, you're going to go to hell when you die. That's, That's basically what Elijah did. You see, it wasn't just the home of Ahab and Jezebel, it was the home of the Baals. He walked right into the hornet's nest. He walked right into the hornet's nest. If you're going to be used of God, you've got to be willing to walk into places in the kingdom arena. I'll tell you another thing I learned from Elijah just by reading this story. When I, I, I did. I honestly looked at this guy as with a, you know, I knew a lot about Elijah already, but I tried to look at it like as if I'd never read it. Like, what, what can I really learn from him, right? What can I really learn from this guy? I, w- I would tell you another character trait of his DNA of a world changer. I would say God uses those willing to ask for power with the right motive. This is a really important truth that I really want you to learn. 
I really want you to learn this. The scriptures are full of times when we are told to ask. Ask. It is all throughout the Old Testament. It is all throughout the New Testament. It's full in Jesus' teaching. Jesus is constantly telling us to ask, 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 ask for power. And so Elijah did that. He said, and I want you to look in verse 37, and I put it on the screen if you're watching from home. Look at what he said in, in 1 Kings 18, 37. He said, answer me, O Lord, answer me. But, but look at his motive. This is really important. Look at his motive. So that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God. And that you've turned their heart back again. What does the Bible tell us in the book of James? You have not because you ask not. And when you do ask, you ask with improper motives that you may use it on your own pleasures. So the reason that we often don't see our prayers answered is, you know why? I've, I've, taught, I've said this many times from this stage. If you're, if, you're, if, if you're not connecting with God in prayer and you're not seeing something move, the first question you need to ask yourself is, God, is my motive wrong? Because my motive has been wrong many times. My motive has been off many times. It really has. So Elijah's motive is revealed in the prayer. He wasn't wanting some glory to build the next mega church, right? I mean, can you imagine what America would have done with this guy? Oh, my goodness, man. We'd have made T-shirts, rubber wristband things. We'd have put him on a tour. We'd have put a bunch of concerts with him. I mean, we would have, this guy, this guy would, you know, and he would have quit being a pastor. Why pastor people? You can make a way lot more money going to conferences and tell them how you smoked all the bail prophets one day. I mean, seriously. And it's a way easier job. You don't have to deal with committees. You don't, got to, you don't got to get complaints. You just speak, lay it down, and get on the plane and leave. Let everybody deal with your mess, right? I'm telling you, this guy, I mean, he would have had no shortage of opportunities in America. He wasn't trying to build a brand. He was a kingdom builder. And because he was a kingdom builder, God used him. You see, if you're willing for God to use you with the right motive, God will use you. I'm telling you. I've seen it too many times in my own life. The times when my motive was right and I wanted to see God do something because I saw a hurt or a need or I saw an open space in the kingdom of God that could be filled, God did something. Ask with the right... Ask. Ask for power. Notice, he did ask for power. Answer me, God. Answer me. Right? I, there's a part of me in this story, and I don't know if this is theologically accurate or not, but this is just completely in my head. It's kind of... Not that God can be manipulated, but, you know, he kind of corners him. It's like, you got, you got to come through. Or I'm, I'm not just out of a reputation. Like, they're going to think you're not alive. I mean, it, it's, it's a very unique story, really. It's got a, there's a lot going on right there that, that I don't have time to get into this morning. But I can tell you this, his heart was right, and he certainly wasn't trying to manipulate God because God can't be manipulated. But the problem was the people were being polluted, and so something had to be done. And now I, I want to give you one more truth about Elijah's DNA that I've learned as I've read about him. And it's this one, that God uses those willing to walk alone for his glory. Now, that sounds like a great bumper sticker. It sounds really churchy. It sounds really Sunday morning. But if you've ever walked alone because of a conviction you've held, it's not fun. Ask some of your sons and daughters right now in middle school and high school. Really. Ask them. Ask them what it's like to hold on to your virginity because you want to please the Lord. And all of your girlfriends make fun of you in algebra because of what you won't do with a boy. Ask them. Ask our students that are doing their best to live for the Lord and walk alone, ask people that have done it. You see, it doesn't get easier because when you get older 
and nobody's looking, and you're in the office of your direct report, and you're asked to fudge the numbers, or you're asked to do something that's not just, or have a position that saves the company but isn't righteous, and you've got a decision to make, and you hear it in your head, and you hear it in your heart. It's not easy to be alone when you know that your career could be over on that day. I'll never forget. This wasn't in my notes, but I'm, it's in my mind, so I'm going to go with it for a minute. I'll never forget, I, I knew a man that he literally, back in the like 40s or 50s, he helped bring televised news to Nashville. That's a pretty big deal, right? I mean, he helped, he helped set up the, one of the first production companies to show the news on television when, when television was coming out. And he was negotiating. He was telling me about negotiating this really big contract. Like, this was like in the 50s. And he said there was a guy that, if, that could make it all happen, and he had to get this contract on paper. And, and they, were, they were negotiating the contract, and the man kept asking, well, can, do you all have the production capabilities to do this? Do you have the production capabilities to do this? What about that? What about this? What about that? And they were going through. And then he asked him one, one place, he said, what about the production capabilities to do that? And the man told me, he said, I just looked at him and said, no, we're not there yet. And you know what the executive of that company told the man? He said, I knew you weren't. I just wanted to see if you'd admit it. So I'm going to give you the contract because everybody else has told me they can do it. And I've done my due diligence and nobody can do it. So let's build it. See, in those moments, you never know what's going to happen. you got to be willing to stand alone and not be silent. One of the things I see about Elijah is that he wasn't silent. He wasn't silent. Because silence in this particular case would have been disobedience. Look at what Elijah said to the people of Israel. He, said, he, he brings them all close by, and what does he say? He says, how long will you hesitate? between two opinions. How long will you bounce back and forth? And it says the people didn't answer him a word. Why do you think they didn't answer him a word? I'll tell you why they didn't answer him a word. They couldn't answer him. They couldn't. They couldn't answer him because they had become spiritually blended. And if you're spiritually blended, well, you're just spiritually polluted. And that's, that's the reality of the situation. They were spiritually compromised. They were living between the God of pop culture and everything that was trendy and, and going on in the pop world and the God of their ancestors. Elijah was willing to be misunderstood. He really was. And, he, and, he, and that's why God used him. He, he didn't need a crowd to support what he knew about the Lord God. You know, I think what you're seeing right here with why the people couldn't answer him a word let me tell you what it comes down to. And I really want you to let this go deep into the marrow of your soul. Because I think it truly does apply to many people that have been around the church for some time. It comes down to the issues of ownership. So what do you mean, Jason, ownership? It comes down to the issues of ownership. Let me tell you what happened right there in that moment when he says, how long will you go back and forth? Let me tell you what was going on with the people of Israel right there. Yahwehism, or the God of Israel, worshiping the Lord, it was seen as the religion of their ancestors. Antiquated, maybe out of date, not as good as it once was, old-fashioned, not current. And so for the people that were still 
having jobs and having kids and raising families and the people that were not of the older generation. It would have been the people in the middle generations. In those middle generations, what was going on right there was they valued the faith. This is important. I hope you're listening. If you're watching at home, pay attention. It would have been like today saying they valued the faith of their grandparents, but they didn't own it. They just valued it. They valued it. It mattered to them. They knew that when you went to church with grandma, you didn't wear shorts. You're going to hear about it at lunch or sooner, even if you're 50, (laughs) right? They knew what it meant to go to church on Easter. They knew what their faith system of their ancestors were, but they didn't own it. And let me tell you, this is a big deal. Elijah owned it. He owned it. The question I have for you this morning is, if you're going to navigate strange days, if you're going to make it when it really gets strange, do you Own your faith. Do you own it? And you better be careful before you answer that. Because the Bible says there's going to come a day. The Bible says there's going to come a day when you are going to stand before a holy God. And when you stand before that holy God, your advocate is not going to be your daddy. Your advocate is not going to be your mom. Your advocate isn't going to be your granddad who was the preacher. Your your advocate isn't going to be your favorite football coach that was the believer. Your advocate can only be in that moment the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you have not been redeemed and reconciled through the power of the cross and the power of the open grave and the infilling of the Holy Spirit, I'm telling you, you're not going to spend an eternity in heaven. You're not. And it's a tragedy. And so what happens most of the time is is people, they grow up around the church. And I wonder sometimes if the problem isn't that we don't know Jesus. I wonder if the problem is that we're just way too familiar with him. To the point that a prophet has no honor among his people, so to speak. Do you own your faith? Do you own your faith? I see it in our younger generations all the time. The millennial generation. I see it in college students that are coming up right now. I'm telling you, I see it and I hear it all the time. They know what their student pastor believed. They know what their pastor believed. They know what their mom and dad believed. They're just not 100% sure. And they think they kind of believe that too, but they don't really know. You got to own your faith. Elijah was willing to stand alone. He was willing to speak out. He was willing to call and ask for power. He was willing to be used of God because the miracles to him weren't arbitrary. They weren't theoretical. He had seen them. He knew the power of his God. He had experienced the provision of his God. He had experienced the moving of God. And so he could stand toe-to-toe with those bales, and he could say, choose this day, church. Choose this day. And I'm willing to stand alone if I have to. Elijah owned his faith. He didn't just value it. He was truly redeemed. And and why this matters so much, friends, is, let me tell you why it matters to me so much. It matters to me so much because the New Testament is very clear. Jesus is very clear. That in the days to come, as things progressively get worse, and we're called to be the joy givers and the people that have a different story, We're called to be light in darkness and do it with a good attitude. We're called to be the people of redemption. We're called to be all of that. And as those times come at us, and as you read the New Testament, the Bible's very clear that in the last days, there will be a thinning. You will know, so to speak, the sheep from the goats. The Bible is very clear. 
Paul's been clear about it. Jesus was very clear about it. Our faith will cost us something at some point. And if you don't own your faith, you're going to get eaten alive. More than likely, you're just going to fade into the fog. But that's short-lived. Because Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you to my Father. And that sounds like a harsh statement. No, you did it. You did it. If I deny him in that hour, if I deny him with my lifestyle, if I didn't own my faith, I just valued it because my parents told me, if it wasn't a part of Jason's actual belief system, then on that day, I'm going to be accountable. And I'm telling you, let me tell you, this is good. It sounds like heavy news. This is good news. It's good news because God cares so much about me that he wants me to know that if I will use you, Jason, I will, I will put you in places if you're willing to walk. I will put power on you. He makes every one of you a promise that he's an overcomer, that he, will, that he will testify through you, that his spirit will testify with your spirit that you're a child of God, that neither height nor depth or breadth or any dominion or principality can come between you and him. On and on and on he goes. But what he's asking for is that you own your faith. You know, you often don't think about sharing something with somebody like a tweet or an email or sending them a sermon or sending them a podcast. You don't often think of that as missions, but it is. It's not that you have to send it to the whole world or post every single thing we do at Clearview on your feed. But if, if you've heard a sermon or if you've listened to a podcast, think through your life. I mean, God, who needs to hear this? Sometimes it, it, it doesn't need to go on your Facebook page. Sometimes it needs to go on your Twitter, but sometimes just a simple text to one person can make all the difference in the world to sending them the Word of God in real time. Share it. You'd be surprised how far it goes.